Me and the Dragon Sun will be presenting first. All right. So let's just, I'll quickly introduce us we sure. get into the presentation. Right, so... <laughs> so Ibrahim Sajid is an innovationist, okay, and is currently a third-year medical student at the Alhan University. He has participated in two hackathons as a very energetic person, and both of his projects from the hackathons are actually entering the incubation cycle right now. He's also a CEO of the upstart called Thun. Good name, good name. All right. Which aims to improve mental fitness of students. He uh, aspires to enter the country's health policy sector so that it can benefit the masses. Good job, bro. All right. All over you. All over you. All right. Can I see a show of hands for people who have actually been scared of needles all their life? Hey, right. hey, that's a lot of hands. And so it's a real thing. The needle phobia is a real thing. The fear of metal piercing your skin is real, you know, and a study was done in Southeast Queensland, uh, which recruited about 177 participants, and they were all asked, are they afraid of needles? And guess how many people said they were? 22%. 22% said that they were really scared of needles, and you know, going to the, going to get their blood withdrawn, uh, or given an IV. And so, 16.4% of people said they had a previous traumatic experience, like multiple pricks, or phlebitis, or inflammation when they were having a needle stick. So, um, and 2.3% of people said that they actually refused medical treatment because, just because of this fear. The solution was fairly simple. The solution was kicking the fear out. It involves tricking the mind in believing that the needle isn't there in the first place. Um, and so given the fact that the mind is a very powerful thing, the most powerful thing in the universe, I'm pretty sure it's going to work just fine. So uh, the idea revolves in creating a watch-like structure which has two chambers which are hinged posteriorly. The upper chamber is hollow from the inside, however the lower chamber is, is hollow inside out. And so the, the lower part of the lower chamber which comes in contact with the skin has an anesthetic patch on it and we're going to talk about it just uh, in a minute. Um, so the two chambers, uh, they host the needle inside. So when I raise the flap of the upper, the upper chamber towards the patient, the patient cannot see the needle inside. So it's just tricking the brain and believing that the needle isn't there in the first place. All right, here by making it invisible. Um, all right, so you know, when you put a needle inside, uh, you put a tape on it to make sure it doesn't move, all right? So we're gonna take that thing out of the equation. We are introducing a notch in the lower chamber of the device. So after you insert the needle, you dock the device, you dock the needle in this notch, thereby reducing the need of tapes and everything. Uh, I talked about the anesthetic patch. So um, the anesthetic patch is a two-person lidocaine patch. So when you apply it on the skin, um, it makes the area numb. So when I am inserting the needle inside the vein, you don't feel uh, the needle being there, hence being the painless aspect of it. Um, the literature tells that um, the amount of time it goes numb for is approximately two times the time it has been applied for. So if I put it for one minute, how many time minutes would it be numb for? Five. Two minutes, great! Um, so, uh, wrapping the story, so like you take a cone, right, you eat everything off and nothing goes to waste. Uh, the part of the watch, nothing goes to waste. Um, the, the wristband works as a tourniquet. So like a normal tourniquet, it helps create the upstream pressure which is needed for IV cannulation to take place. Um, and so, we bring a very cool thing to it. So the upper chamber, it has an infrared diode on it. Um, so if you've seen the AccuVein things which show uh, the veins clearly, so when the lid is uh, taken up, the light comes on, um, and so you can actually find the veins very clearly. If you can see the picture right there, so the infrared waves are absorbed by the hemoglobin, which uh, makes the venous uh, vena culture come to the surface of it, and so you can easily pinpoint the location of where you're pointing the needle, where you're putting the needle inside, here by reducing the chances of uh, missed breaks or hit, not hitting it. So here's the story, I'm going to sum it up. So the nurse finds a vein, they tie the watch there, they raise the pack, they raise the upper chamber. So there are cartoons on the chamber, right? The upper flap. So the child is distracted, obviously. So you put the needle inside, after a minute of application, you remove the patch, you put the needle inside, you dock it, and that's it. That's it. And so, in the emergency, we don't expect the children to um, be very happy, right? You expect them to be fidgety. You don't expect them to lie still around and uh, wait for their stuff to take place, right? And so there's a huge chance that the needle level once it dis dislocate ho jai, and chances of phlebitis increase. So what we're doing is we're putting a gyro sensor inside the wristband. For those who don't know what a gyro sensor is, the gyro sensor converts mechanical movement, angular velocity, using the piezoelectric knowledge to an electrical signal. So how is it going to work? 
सो गिव अ चांस के द बच्चा इज मूविंग दर हैंड बहुत ज़्यादा मोर देन द प्री सेट वेलासिटी जो हमने रखी हुई है एंगुलर वेलासिटी तो अ सिग्नल विल बी सेंट टू द नर्सिंग स्टेशन फॉर गोन गो एंड चेक के बच्चे की नीडल वहाँ से डिस्लोकेट हुई है कि नहीं हुई कि अगर डिस्लोकेट हो गई है तो इज़ अ चांस ऑफ फ्लेबाइट राइट सो वन सी वन इज गोज अवे द फ्लेबाइट चांस इज रिड्यूस द डिवाइस इज करेंटली कॉस्टेड एट थ्री हंड्रेड रुपीज इन इट्स गोन गीव गोड एट दी हाई एंड हॉस्पिटल एट द मोमेंट बट इट्स ह्यूज लीव ऑफ फेथ दट वॉन्स द मैस प्रोडक्शन स्टार्ट द प्राइस विल ड्रॉप एंड इट विल इकनॉमिकल फॉर द लो इनकम यूजर्स Um, currently in the team, I have Namra Nasser. She is a biomedical engineer at Northern Illinois University. She is a chief designer officer. Um, also, I have Vilil, who is going to tell his bio in a, quite a minute. Um, he is most likely the Dr. Watson to me, Sherlock. Sure. So, <laughs> so um, it's currently being designed on AutoCAD software. After which, it will be 3D printed. Um, it, uh, permission will be taken from the AQ ERC. After which, clinical trials will be done, and so um, the pros and cons will be seen. alteration will be made um, and you know then the then the device will be marketed to the the masses and let's hope it's, it's a good thing take, take for everyone okay good question answers no all right so we're hoping the question answers okay yeah no <laughs> so when when do you take the tourniquet off or do you do you lessen the uh, you lose it You loosen it. So after you have cannulated, you loosen the strap. You don't take it off because it's part of the watch. And then they can't take it off. The children can't rip it off, or you have somebody in there to tell them don't fidget with the watch. I mean, children are never alone in the ER, right? I hope I hope there is a supervisor in there. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> All right. So how about the pain management? Because right. young children, when they see hospital, how do you move their psychology from, like you know? All right. So um, even the adults. So when you see uh, when you go to hospital, you see uh, your heart rate is really high. The white coat effect, we call it, right? So the the point of minimizing is that उसके ऊपर हम colorful cartoons वगैरह लगा रहे हैं. ठीक है वो stickers की तरह के हैं. तो अगर कोई लड़का है तो band ten का sticker लगा दो. कोई लड़की है तो bar की लगा दें. Sound sex is pretty fine. So, so when you raise the flap, so the child is already distracted, right? So, or then in his hand, he gives toffee, whatever, give him something. Do something. Do some. Be creative already. You have to be creative as well after, without this thing. With permission. With permission. Yeah, with permission. Yeah, see, definitely. Anything else? All right, guys. I hope that the first experience was exciting. Yeah. All right, Dr. Nasir is now picking up the fate of the next experienced speaker. All right, Umme Ahmed Chiba. Apologize for that. So just a quick introduction for Ome Aman Chiba. She is a graduate from the Dow Institute of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Uh, followed by further training from the Yakut National Hospital. She has also participated in three hackathons at AKU, and one of her projects is also in the I2S incubation cycle. She has also been working with Pakistan Speaks and NGO since 2016. Right. So a big round of applause for Ome. <laughs> Okay, so today I am here to present a story of my scary journey from main gate to emergency department. It was first by 2017 when the when I was entered through the main gate, which was very adjacent to the emergency department. I see a bunch of people here. Uh, this is the picture of the civil hospital where given any time of day people are milling around and they stop me and ask me about the different location ke did you know where is the pharmacy did you know where is the uh, surgical unit as they saw ke oh white coat hai to she must be know all the places but on that day i wasn't unable to help them because i was also in the same boat of finding my way to hr after wasting almost my one hour i searched the department by myself luckily but i witnessed no one was there to help me everyone from general staff to doctor are in rush and if they guided me about the location they guided like an extreme technical uh, technical way like second left first right but due to topographical issue i am able to understand their direction 
uh, everyone was in hurry from general staff to doctor. The problem area is uh, every 30 feet, the study is shown in uh, PubMed that every 30 feet, uh, people are stopped the you know, hospital, hospital person to find, you know, to ask the location. And uh, 4,500 people are, you know, hospital management are asked the hospital. So what if you fail to crush the, if, what if you fail to attend the crush call on time, this will happen while a case doctor, if you say the patient that I'm sorry, I'm unable to save your patient. So patient didn't, you know, so I'm wondering that what happened if patient and attender will unable to find out their way on time, will they lose their loved one just because they didn't reach on time. Uh, in healthcare setting, every minute is crucial to the patient. Healthcare providers have sometimes a minute to save life in emergency. So uh, every minute is crucial to the patient. So patient didn't waste their time by roaming around the hospital in search of their ways. They maybe have uh, some uh, lateral discrimination, so they are unable to understand the directions of the employees as well. Okay, so I'm coming up with the two ideas, red stripper and the special GPS system in order to maintain the <coughs> patient criteria. The red stripper are here and it is and it is painted through emergency department from all over the room like this if you uh, want to trace emergency department you just trace this red line which is placed all over the hospital from parking area from uh, emergency rooms and from the hospital main gate as well okay and if you want to chase pharmacy department from the emergency room you just need to follow blue line if you want to chase lab you just need to follow green line and if you just want to chase radiology you just need to uh, follow the yellow line which save your time and your patient time as well so okay or this uh, this will also save your time this will tell you that how much time is left in order to chase your emergency as you move uh, forward like they said okay 30 feet away not 5 minutes away not 1 minute away and uh, it's also give you the shortcuts as well connection is the only indoor mapping navigation and digital wayfinding vendor that is 100% focus on healthcare market and these are some users of uh, connection but it, it's used by international market it's not feasible in our, our society because most of people are illiterate in our society and they may can't afford uh, this fancy apps as well and this jargon directions are unable to digest by the caregiver and the attender as well okay symbolic one uh, the next idea is the symbolic one uh, the the symbols are placed on the walls uh, in order the like patient may have the light red light discrimination to in order to avoid this problem the symbols are placed on the walls as well uh, which may you locate the <coughs> direction of emergency on time as well moving on uh, upcoming slide i will show you how you find the full hospital as well okay so this will be the future hospital if you want to chase the emergency department you just need to follow that line from surgical unit from lab and from the emergency department and if you have android you just follow okay uh, uh, move on the start direction 30 feet from that point like uh, except the direction of right and left the apps give the direction of move start direction 30 feet move own direction 20 feet away like this so start direction 30 feet away okay what's the hurdle Painted wood may affect the decor of the respective area of the hospitals, okay? Uh, fail for those who are colorblind. And uh, there should be GPS in the patient mobile. However, hospital visits are unplanned. Thank you. You're open for questions? Yes. Hello. Um, so my question was, how does your, how are the red strips or the yellow or the Okay, green? so every department has the unique coat color, okay? Uh, for example, if you want to uh, 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 chase uh, medicine, you need to follow the green line. Yeah, no, I get that. My question was not that, okay. I'm sorry. Um, my question was, how are these strips going to be any okay, different? Okay, painted. 
How are they going to be any different from the signs, the billboards that we have around the hospital? The arrows, uh, because you know how you talked about the limitation that you're going to have. Mm -hmm. The hospital's decor is going to be affected, and some private hospitals might not want that, right? So uh, as an Alhan, there are uh, boards around everywhere, and they very well point out that, oh, this way is the emergency. You And they're very directly pointed. They're not half as a high wire. OK, if, you, if I come from main gate, so it's like the jogging direction. Right? Like for main gate to emergency department, both like uh, uh, cut speech mein aate and didn't, as a patient I didn't understand the direction of emergency department if I came from this uh, main gate. Okay, well, well I, I, that might be the case, but I think I might, I'll study here, that's why I know that. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zara. I'm from Muldan, Nishta Hospital. Um, I'm actually a graduate of Aachen University, but I'm doing surgery training over there. So, I think your presentation was really good, and it will be really, really helpful in Nishta Hospital, Muldan, because most of the patients and attendants mm. that we see there are either uneducated, or even if they are educated, it's really difficult to go, uh, go around the hospital. As we have 31 wards, hmm. and nobody can find a way. In the beginning, I used to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> as well as the resident, like uh, from there, you also uh, like uh, okay, okay, shortcut. Kya hai? Right. The number of the essence of the ignite. Your time. Thank, Thank you. All right. Uh, just a heads up for the audience, you guys are also on a time limit, so I just have some questions which are precise. Right? Because I just have two minutes, we're gonna clap you guys off as well. Oh, so okay. Just keep it precise, all right? So okay. it's a two-way game. <laughs> all right. Alright, Shafiq, we have another gem. Dr. Walid Farooqi. Oh, Dr. Walid Farooqi. Uh, I have two introductions for Walid. One is in the pocket and one is my personal one. <laughs> if I do that, it's going to be very uh, censored. <laughs> Make some on the stage. It's a relatively <coughs> uncensored one. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Dr. Walid Farooqi is a medical doctor by training. He's also a graduate of the Alpha University class of 2016. Interested in healthcare improvement strategy, building financial modeling and marketing. Is it required? Who? Okay, you. Dictionary. Know. All right. Okay. Uh, so he's a co-director of CCIT. He earns his living by that. All right, and he's <laughs> and uh, he's constantly tries to improve upon the status quo. He takes an active interest in engaging various niche groups within AKU and AKU Edge. When not out and about, he can be found glued to a screen controller in hand in hand and gaming it out, which is basically most of his time. So yeah. All right. Well, <coughs> right. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, the Ignite talk today. My name is Walid Faruqi, and today I'll be running you through an alternative healthcare delivery method which focuses around the patient, as Dr. Adil Hadar was just talking about. But before we get into that, I want everybody to really get into the patient's shoes. And for the next five minutes, everybody in this room is the patient. Let's imagine you start to get some vague abdominal pain. Uh, it's roughly 9 p.m. on a random Monday. Um, what the first thing you do is you is you head over to the ATU ER, which is 35 hours, 35 minutes away. You get there, you're a little, uh, you have a little bit of a road rage, uh, you enter the ER, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of chaos, you're pretty sure you just saw a dead body being wheeled out. The emotional turmoil starts to kick in. Uh, by the time the investigation and the consults are done, um, it's, it's already midnight. Tens of doctors have come around asking the exact same question over and over again. And they, and they mention there's some sort of a disease where they have to fix you by performing a minor surgery in which they're going to take out a part of your stomach. Now, being a layman, uh, the, these two statements being said in the exact same sentence doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, you, find, you, take, you take the next four hours trying to find a bed. When you get there, you haven't slept, you haven't eaten, you haven't drank. Uh, you're still in a lot of pain. Um, and the anxiety has peaked. Uh, by the time your add-on procedure is completed, it's already 6 p.m. on Tuesday, where your post-op care starts, and then you're discharged on Thursday at 2 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, that was status quo, and that has worked for decades. Um, but what I really want to emphasize is, it works for healthcare providers, it does not necessarily work for the patients. What we need to move towards today is the patient-centric care, and what we're going to do now is we're going to develop patient-centric care from the ground up. Everything that you saw, status quo, we're eradicating it. And then we're going to build up again. And so let's imagine by some weird uh, fate, uh, everybody starts to get the exact same pain again on the exact same day and the exact same time. 
Um, only this time we're going to go through the patient-centric model. You reach the ER, nothing has changed up until midnight, but that's when the real magic begins, doesn't it? Um, so going through the patient-centric models, um, if you are expected to be getting a surgery, it doesn't necessarily make sense that you wait 16 hours to get that done. And so the patient-centric model basically dictates you get the surgery at 2 a.m. Where you, where you then start with your post-surgical care and your discharge on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Now this has obviously has a lot of benefits, but before, before, but before delving into that, I want to talk about a couple of different models that can be utilized to reach this this exact same flowchart. The first is obviously calling the surgeon in at 2 a.m. Now, that's going to fail for a multitude of reasons, including but not limited to logistics, support, finances, scheduling, etc. The second alternative might sound a little crazy, uh, but hear me out. What if the emergency doctor that's seeing you as you enter the ER could wheel you into the OR and perform this basic appendectomy on you? Now, this may seem a little, a little bit crazy, but that's okay, because that's exactly why I'm here and I'm going to talk you through the benefits of, of having such a model. The first and the foremost, and probably the most obvious benefit, obviously the decreased door to over time. Now this is an important metric that is utilized all across, all across the world to talk about health metrics and healthcare improvement. Um, secondly, what did we talk about? You're getting discharged on Wednesday instead of Thursday. So that's one day less of hospital, hospital stay. Now I'm looking at this from a patient's perspective. If I were a patient, uh, I'd much rather stay two days instead of three. And if that one day that was being cut was the one that I was spent worrying and in pain, I take that any day. Um, the third is the OR. You have ORs that are overbooked during the day and understaffed during the night. What this model will allow is to perform some basic procedures during the night and through the night, which will decrease your workload the next day on the OR. In which case, you might be potentially be looking at some cost cutting, some cost saving, and some HR uh, management. There's a lot of revenue generation as well uh, tied into this model. And the first is obviously through increased turnout. If your patients are leaving one day sooner than expected, you're going to see your hospital is expected to see a lot more patients in, in turn increasing revenue. You could potentially also charge a premium for this service. In terms of continuity of care, ladies and gentlemen, this is perfection. The minute you enter the ER door to the minute you leave the hospital, you only have one primary doctor. That is gold standard healthcare. And that's exactly what we're, what we're trying to achieve. In terms of scale up, in an ideal world, uh, there's so much that can be done vertically and horizontally on this idea. Um, if you include paramedics, for, for these basic procedures can be performed at the patient's homes with remote, uh, with remote monitoring. And that's, that's just one key aspect that can be looked at. In terms of outcomes, there's, there's really two major outcomes that I'm very interested in out of this Ignite talk. Um, the first is engagement. There's obviously a lot of research and thought that's gone into this presentation, so I would love to have a chat with every single one of you in this room. Uh, get your thoughts on what you, if you think this will work, if it won't work, your thoughts, critique, comments, any and everything that you may have, please do throw it at me so that I may even either improve this or practice this altogether. Um, the second uh, parameter that I'm looking at is if even, if even one person walks out of this room thinking status quo doesn't make sense, my Ignite would have worked. Um, for healthcare improvement, what we need to understand in the first step is accepting the status quo is not perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do so much more, and we should be doing so much more. My name is Walid Faruqi, and this is my camera. Right, let's get more questions. All right, let's have the first question behind you. Yes, hello. Um, hey. uh, my name is Dr. Mark Qureshi. I'm an EM consultant uh, from uh, UK. And my question is, we know that the only metric that shows that uh, patient care and that shows mortality is the time to be seen by an ED clinician and the time to discharge. So you're talking about taking, if you have five ER doctors working that night, one of them off the shop floor to perform a procedure that takes 40 to 50 or up to an hour, especially in a person who's not trained to do surgery. And that means that the waiting time for the 100 patients outside who are waiting to be seen by a doctor goes up. So you might be improving one patient's care, you are delaying 100 patients' care in that. I think that would be the first thing I talk about. Sure. Uh, that's, that's, that's a very good question. And that's something that I wanted to cover but couldn't as part of this. So what we're looking at is a hybrid model which is not going to replace emergency medicine or surgery. And so having EM doctors on call or having rotations in which you just have EM doctors, you might need six instead of five EM doctors, but on the flip side, you will also need lesser surgeons on call. So technically, you will still be saving costs in terms of uh, 
human resources. So it's, it's all about numbers and I guess a health economist might be able to understand uh, load versus what number of procedures are being executed every year. Uh, but the numbers game can be run obviously and can be catered to accordingly. We could go up on EM search doctors for sure. There's no reason not to. Other questions? I was that clear? Yeah, okay. So we do not have emergency physicians in Nishtar. Yeah. We, uh, as a surgical team, we go to the emergency department and once we receive a patient, we do the procedure and then ship the patient to the ward. So that's exactly what we are doing right now. But uh, if you are saying about training, so definitely emergency, emergency physicians could do appendectomies and minor procedures. That would be something that we can look into. But if you are saying that we should train paramedics to go to a home and do such things, I don't think that that would be visible because we do have some operating technicians attempting appendectomies and similar procedures, but they are not successful at all. Right. Uh, all right. We cannot take your answers. Thank you very much. That's a good question. That's a good question. That's a yes, good yes, question. yes. I understand that. Come on. Give me an answer, right. please. Very disappointing, but that's ignite and life. All right. So, all right. Our next. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mahin Khan. Uh, <laughs> right. Mahin Khan and Mehik Narmeen. So I'm going to introduce quickly both of them. Right. So Mahin Khan is a fine year medical student uh, at at Dow. She has aspired to work for the emergency and trauma care setup in Pakistan even before she started med school. She enjoys public speaking, spoken word, and teaching first response to people. Paradoxically, she believes herself to be in a true element while engrossed in a book or writing her heart and mind out. So, Mehak Mahim Khan. Right. And Mehak Narmeen is a third year student at Dow Medical College. Her interest is uh, in medical science, sciences and love for public speaking. Gave way to a newfound passion to teach first response to the masses. When not volunteering, she is often found indulged in nature photography, the dramatics, or a good book with a cup of tea in hand. Big round of applause for both of them. Hi. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mahim Khan and this is my colleague Mehek. Hi. And we're here to represent First Response Initiative of Pakistan, also known as FRIP. FRIP is a student-run, non-governmental, non-profit organization and we aim to teach First Response to the masses in Pakistan. FRIP was uh, formed in 2010 and ever since its inception in 2010, this is the question that has been driving us. What if every Pakistani knew how to save a life? What if at least one person at the side of a road traffic accident knew what exactly to do in order to save a person's life? Can you imagine the consequences that would have? So in order to continue this life-saving mission, this is how, how we operate as an organization. We reach out to medical schools all across Karachi and in parts of Sindh, and we train medical students, and then these, uh, this group of first responders then goes out into the community in order to respond, but also to teach uh, the masses in general. Behind me, you can see a picture from a workshop that we recently conducted in the area of Thar Parker. Similarly, we reach out to communities in Karachi. We go to workplaces, we go to schools, we go to educational institutions. Um, as of now, this year, we've conducted a total of 85 workshops. But no matter how many workshops we conduct, no matter how many people we teach, a significant problem which continues to arise is that not enough people respond. And of those who do, they happen to do so because they were passing by an accident by chance. So in order to counter this problem, Fripp came up with the idea of a mass disaster task force. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our ignite worthy topic for the day. So what is a mass disaster task force on an MDTF? An MDTF is a group or a force of individuals who are highly trained in first response and who can be notified and alerted when an accident or traumatic event occurs in their vicinity. When they'll be notified, they can reach out and they can respond. They will be equipped with proper emergency kits for this purpose. So let's talk about who these volunteers are going to be and what is this force going to comprise of. Well, these are going to be frequent members. Um, we currently have around 450 volunteers, 450 first responders, those who are most dedicated to the cause, who will be highly trained under, under uh, specialists and trauma surgeons, etc. They will be then be supplied with um, emergency kits containing AEDs, advanced airways, etc. Um, it will be completely voluntary, completely non-paid and um, 
this volunteer force is then going to go out and they're going to respond. So now that we have a volunteer force, the only question that remains is that how do you connect that force? How do you utilize that force? How do you get these volunteers to the site of an accident? And I want you to think about how when you need transport, you can call an Uber or a Kareem on your convenience immediately. Our app works in a, a pretty much similar way. We propose to develop an app which will have two versions. One is going to be for mass dissemination. So you and I, anybody who's not a first responder is going to have that app. And the second app, the second version, is going to be present with the first responder. Both of these apps are going to be dependent on a GPS or a 3G system, and therefore the responder can be notified of the nearest occurring uh, accident. May I could further elaborate this? Thank you, Mani. So we've talked about the logistics of it all, right? But how will this actually work? Let's go for a test drive. Um, imagine there's a road traffic accident on Shara and Vessel, which is one of the busiest roads in Karachi, and there are a lot of onlookers. But one onlooker in particular has our app in their phone. So they simply take it out, they tell us where this accident was, the number of people injured, and press send. As we've already talked about, this is very similar to how Kareem or an Uber works. Except that their system links you up with one driver closest to you. Our system will link you up with all the first responders in your vicinity. So let's imagine that I'm a first responder in that area, right? I will receive a, receive a notification that will tell me, uh, one, where exactly is, the, where am I needed? Two, how many people are injured here? And because this is volunteer based, it's up to me if I actually want to go and save lives or I don't. Let's say in either situation, I do go. So once I've arrived at the site, I have to do the following. Tell them the severity, let's say rest. Do I need backup? No, I'm good. And then press OK. Let the system know what's happening. I'll go back to my resuscitations. <coughs> and once the ambulance arrives, I will simply click on resolve and that's it. So I want to add here that we're not saying that this is a substitute for ambulatory services. It's just medical assistance for after you fall for an ambulance and while you wait for it or in certain, certain circumstances when you go to the hospital with them. To sum it all up, the general idea here is that we have a task force, it's trained, it's equipped, we take care of that. There is an accident or mishap in any part of the city. Now how do you connect the two? You use your apps, you use technology. Last but not the least, a huge shout out to the, this organization, uh, Hudzala United. They're currently already working on something similar. What we want to do is introduce an app so as to reduce the mortality rate while people wait for ambulances. So in short, we wish to ignite a change in the emergency medical services in Pakistan currently. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's have some questions. Right, so uh, if it's a busy traffic road, yeah. it's going to take the exact amount of same time to get ambulance eye or the outcome response eye. How is that going to work out on a busy road? Um, okay, so basically the idea of the, uh, the idea that, that we even have as an organization is that a lot of ambulatory services currently in Karachi are not well equipped and their personnel are not completely trained. The first, the, the MDTF, the elite force that we're introducing is going to be completely trained and they're also going to be well equipped. Also, how are you uh, mass uh, distributing this app or on every person having this in their phone? Yeah. Um, yeah, we had this part of the presentation, but then we had to check it out. Um, we we'll use social media. We're very active on social media. We have a lot of thousands of followers on it. And similarly, we'll take steps for it. We have a question over We have a question over here. Yeah, it's more or less saying, what is the response time? Because um, there are a couple of ambulatory services that say is that within 12 minutes, they are there in the incident. I, um, this is Shalina Kumari from Amal Foundation, yeah. we have four days that we need to supply ambulance before 12 minutes. And there are more than um, 190 trained paramedics, so how is it different? And what is the response time? I would like to know that. 
Okay, well, I can only comment on the actual response time when we once we run a pilot drive of a project, once we actually get uh, to the actual work and we run a, a, a test drive, basically a pilot drive, then I can comment on it. So far, it's completely theoretical as of now. Um, but however, on the point that you remarked on, that a lot of ambulatory services are currently functioning in Karachi. The thing is that, um, one, they're not su uh, sufficient, self-sufficient for a, a metropolis that has spawned over miles and has so many people in it. And two, a lot of areas are inaccessible by ambulances. And three, again, uh, there, there aren't trained personnel and the, uh, not all of them are well equipped. Any yeah, other questions? Uh, you answered the question actually, uh, Shalina's question. Uh, 12 minutes is too late for cardiac arrest. We know that. Yeah. And so that is the answer that we need to be there 90 seconds, 120 seconds. We can't do that in that minute. All right. Thank you very much. And we are done with this. Okay. Back to our next one. <coughs> oh, Dr. Hubati. Dr. Hubati. Okay. And then I have to start? Yes. Okay, so Dr. Kubatati, who's known not just for our fiery hair, but also for our fiery spirit. Thank you. Everybody likes my hair. So she's a pediatric emergency physician who trained at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, currently, she's visiting faculty at Dow University of Health Sciences. She is also leading the Child Life Foundation's telemedicine and resuscitation room project and has developed the first pediatric emergency medicine certificate course for mid-level providers who work in pediatric emergency rooms of government hospitals in Karachi. She's an enthusiastic, happy-go-lucky person who loves to eat, yearns to travel, and spends some time practicing yoga. You just, you just finished my presentation, right? right. <laughs> okay, so um, everybody knows about... Uh, I can speak as long as more than mine. Okay, that's okay. So everybody about knows about the drug which is Edwin, which is a famous resuscitation drug. So I would like to say I would like to share my story about what I mean by the adrenaline rush. So uh, what is my story? What happened with me as an emergency resident or as an emergency physician, and how I I start bringing it to change and uh, uh, and how I overcome the adrenaline rush. So what is adrenaline rush? It is not only the resuscitation medicine. It is actually the life of an emergency physician. So an emergency physician life is all about working against normal circadian rhythm. They are outliers. They don't work. They they work properly, but they have different uh, different times of work. Like they don't work on. Uh, um, um, and they work on day night. They eat late. They sleep late. And even balance balance lifestyle is not their cup of a tea. And they even brainstorm late, especially at abnormal hours when they are going to sleep. They brainstorm very well. And with this, what happened, that anxiety, stress, tension, what we're going to do in the resuscitation room, what we are going to do in the emergency room. If you are in an emergency room, there is no patient. You are still thinking about patient. And it's like on that shift, you have a lifelong relationship with anxiety and stress. And with that, you have your sympathetic system is work like 24-7 emergency room. And your fight and flight response is so high. And that is because of the hormone called adrenaline. So what we do with that, so the adrenaline is not the life-saving medication for the re for the patient who are in cardiac arrest, but it, ke it also keeps patient heart pumping, but it's ho also helped the ER physicians in their critical decision making. Even I have a right, right now I have a high adrenaline rush. So what happened when they, when the hypothalamus asked, your brain asked the spinal cord to go to the adrenal gland and shift blood in the, uh, catecholamine adrenaline in the blood. And your heart rate increases, you work without food, so you're because of your glucose, you work on your toes, you go late to the bathroom because your digestive system is low and there is no food break, nothing else, and you just work on the patients. So, like everybody knows, uh, they are all rushing towards either recess or they are being called by somebody else. So what happened with me? So whenever I go with my uh, after my shift to the bed and I want to sleep, I have all day, uh, all night or all day, I have a stressful thoughts about the patients. I could not able to declutter myself. So, um, and initially I thought at 2, uh, I, I, I met Dr. Asit in the morning, I said at 2 a.m. I have a very good idea, we can do this, we can make a guidelines, we can change something else. And initially I thought I was born at 2 a.m., that's why I have a very good critical care thinking at 2 a.m. at the midnight. But then 
but later I recognized because of this overdose, overdose of adrenaline and persistent adrenaline surge, my weight is going to increase. I have high blood pressures. Even I'm, I, I have, but that's okay. So, and I have a very damaged blood vessels. And what happened with me? I have, I became very anxious. I, I have, I have migraine headaches, and I have insomnia, and I start gaining weight. So these all are the four system sy symptoms, which is after ha after it being given to me in the emergency physician in, in my in my life. So ER physician needs to understand what they need to understand is how they, they have to manage their adrenaline rush. Not that is because it's important for their well -being, physician well-being, but it's also spe 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 it's a very important about their own well-being. So what you're going to do, you just have to change your cycle from the sympathetic system to the parasympathetic system. So you have to convert the fight and flight response to the rest and digestive system. So you have to introduce a balance in your body. You have to allow your body to rest and repair. And it's not happen by increasing, you have to increase your serotonin level, not by doing and or taking SSRI, but implementing yoga, meditation, and high intensity training. You have to take care of yourself very well. You have to eat clean because we don't eat clean well. We, we don't have a eating. Everybody knows who works at APU, samosas are in our blood. Yeah. So low carbohydrate diet, start taking good foods and lots of water. Because because of this adrenaline, we start having lots, uh, start using our, uh, became dehydrated. Even at sick kids emergency room, we have the uh, pediatric lollipops, which we used to have ORS. And have a special me time. You have to travel, not for the conferences, and you have to study the books. And for me, in the last, I will just say, don't be a victim of it. It translate your adrenaline rush into a most creative, innovative idea. Just every idea is a great idea. Look at the keywords, make your diary. Because the most important thing is the self-care of the emergency physician. Heart always supply blood to itself through the coronaries first before to the coronaries first before the brain. Every ER physician needs to know their adrenaline surge and they need to re-rest in. Right now, my adrenaline surge is very high. Thank you very much. So, Mubha so has you. definitely touched the hearts and the community <laughs> of pretty much everyone sitting here. Um, so, with that, let's start the question answer session. Yes. It's, uh, hello, thank you again. So, I have a question for you. Um, I'm not as concerned about my adrenaline rush or my parasympathetic nervous system as I am about the two years after I retire because the evidence suggests that not just emergency physicians, but emergency responders, uh, anybody who works in emergency care, within two years of retiring, they die. And I think it's probably because of lack of adrenaline. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, that is because of lack of adrenaline. So you have to, you have to make a balance in your body so that you can live two more years. <laughs> That's all. You have a question? Yeah. My question is for right now, how we can compensate like this kind of adrenaline rush? Right now you are facing I am <laughs> having my water. No, like biggest student when we are like present in your present and we are a little bit anxious like you like so how how do you compensate it? Like right now. Um, you know, I'm talking about the adrenaline rush and I know everybody in this um uh, uh, in this uh, auditorium had less information than I have. Because I learned my, I did my homework, so that's that's the question. That's your that's your answer. What else? Okay, one question for you. So the early death part is it just restricted to emergency doctors, or are basic scientists uh, free from that? I might be interpreting the data completely wrong, mm. but uh, it seems to suggest to me that we need that adrenaline rush to keep us living. Yes. Uh, we, we become so dependent upon it that if it stops, we stop. 
let's uh, let's stay in our lab and offices. I think that's uh, easier. Okay, let's move on to our last last speaker, and definitely not the least, our last speaker is. Lawyer man. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Just gonna quickly increase the market because it's very boring, so I'm just gonna do it quickly. So Dr. Shelia Hamani, uh, she holds a PhD in early childhood ECT and program evaluations. Uh, she holds a science of ECT certification, and she uh, she's a senior manager at Emily Adam Foundation and enjoys uh, as as a professor as well. Dr. Hamani also editor in chief of childhood matters and all that. That's impressive. Ooh. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, that's all. <laughs> okay. And Ms. Mona Jindani, she holds an MBA in Education Management and Advanced Diploma in Human Development in ECD. She's okay. currently working as Academic Advisor for ECD for a region stint at the Alpha and Education Service Pakistan. So, last speakers <laughs> of this night. So hello everyone, uh, we are here to present the idea of teaching emergency health to the children under eight. And uh, we are presenting our advocacy idea, advocacy resource material. So as we all know that in Pakistan, we are already facing environmental issues and we have already, uh, in Pakistan, we have total to 11.8 million uh, population, out of which 26% are under nine years old children. And they are at high risk because uh, although they are facing lots of issues about health, and this is very important to teach them the emergency care health, that how to deal with the something is happening or some emergency has happened. So why this is all happening, that this is, so why this is all happening because there are lack of awareness and that children should be prepared under eight that about holistic uh, holistic development and then the all of the things that how to deal with and how to remember some of the emergency contact number and when we need some uh, uh, some care so how we can contact so here i'm presenting our advocacy resource material which named is uh, the newsletter it's named as childhood matter to us in which we have sub things and there are uh, we have already uh, once in quarter we publish this newsletter through multimedia and uh, through social media, through Facebook, through WhatsApp, and we have uh, in print and social media, we are using this both, uh, this both. And then we have the, our newsletter and they can, ex uh, the Pakistan, the all of the provinces, people can access this and we have this newsletter in English and Urdu both, so that all of the audience can understand both in both of the languages. And in that, we have some things like first aid, basic health, emergency, important number, fire safety, and heat wave. So this all are the sub theme sections in which we, uh, this we are catering in our newsletter. So let's see what's in our newsletter. So poems are children's friend, and if they if you have to teach first aid through a poem, it should be. If my eyes are red and itchy, what should I do? I should splash your water. If my eyes are red and itchy, splash your water, splash your water. So that's how it's done. In order to teach basic health concept, we've given different pictures of diseases and preventive cares to it. Yeah, so the pictures are there for the diseases and in order to teach ambulance number because ambulance safety and it's very important to know about the ambulance number and the need of ambulance. So we are doing it through a story by giving a model and certain questions. Uh, in the story, there is an importance of ambulance is taught to the young children and that's how they remember the numbers. The other activity focuses on the important numbers. Uh, so the child sees a picture of a police, they know what to dial. So it's a dialing game. So if they see the picture of their parents, which numbers they need to dial. And that's how they are learning the numbers of their important caregivers. So for the fire safety, we have given certain pictures with the I spy game. So I spy with my little eyes. If there is a fire in the house, what I need to do? I need to run away or call an ambulance or call a fire brigade if somebody's. Uh, the other thing is like combating heat. We've given certain words related to heat emergency and children will have to locate it in this word game. So once the moment they locate the word game in that particular uh, box, the parent or the caregiver would talk about that particular word. That was the importance of ORS in heat. 
So in order to teach road safety, um, we've given certain coloring pictures about the traffic rules, about the importance of green, yellow light. This way, young children learn road safety with an interactive activities to it. Then there is a section which says and talks about tips for parents and caregivers. It has tips related to like if they need to have the health information card available with them all the time for the child. They need to display emergency contact list in their house. Then there is a last section that talks about con contributions because our newsletter is ISN registered. So whoever is interested to put their contributions, they can email us, they can send the stories which are child friendly, they can send the activities. So we can disseminate through our uh, newsletter. The dissemination strategy that we are using, because it's a free, low-cost, social media-oriented newsletter, so we are doing it through register email, Facebook pages, register fa Facebook, and we're also doing it through WhatsApp group, whereby we have more than 1,500 registered users with us. The impact is, again, it's a child-friendly content. It's free and accessible to everybody. It's caregiver-friendly. It addresses the social needs, and it's done through word of mouth. So it's free, you can pass it on to anybody, and also you can generate impact by disseminating. The purpose of this entire newsletter is awareness through newsletter and child development through print media and social media. So this is what we are targeting because educating very young is the most crucial need of the time. We need to teach them autonomous healthcare. We would like to acknowledge our editorial board contributors, Noun Project, who allow us to use all these graphics in our newsletter. You can go and see Childhood Matter to Us, uh, type it on Google, you can see it at AQ Conference for allowing us to present this advocacy idea. Thank you. All right, so let's have our questions. <coughs> Could you just speak up? Yeah. yeah. It's a suggestion that um, there's a program called Little Medical School that just started recently, a few months ago. So if you want to go with your ideas to them, that's what they're doing. It's an after school program they're teaching kids on public. Okay, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. What else? Okay. Yeah. So have you considered uh, going past uh, the uh, older kids as well? Um, it's just three to eight, but what about past eight? Because it's a very interesting uh, uh, concept. Past eight, you see, because we've seen the national curriculum. So if you see national curriculum, health and hygiene, emergency drills, they are done with grade three onwards. Okay. But there's nothing for early childhood, three-year-old. How do you need to teach them if they are wounded in the school, if they you know fall down or something? Thank you. Uh, yeah. The yonre is early childhood. Anything else? All right. Thanks. Any other? So it looks like a very comprehensive talk, so I guess nobody has any questions. Very good. All right, that completes our talks. While the judges complete their assessment, I would request Dr. Asad Mia to come over here and give us a, his impression of today's oh my God. suggestion. <laughs> Well, am I supposed to like to summarize this? Um, well, um, thank you to all the igniters. Can we have a big round of applause for all the igniters? Because so they have put in time and effort. Um, typically, we have like a three-month uh, preparation in which uh, after uh, after abstract selection, <clears throat> the igniters are uh, invited. They're put together in one room, and then we make them practice. And it's three meetings over a three month period. This time around was fabulous was all of that was condensed into one month. So even a bigger hand for these guys because they did everything in one month. That was partly because uh, we couldn't maintain our own timeline, so we've got to hurry up as well. So while uh, uh, somebody is adding up the scores, yes, we in the past we never had scores, but then um, in Ignite 5, we started having scoring. And we just felt that uh, it was um, much more exciting somehow. People were, people started taking Ignite more seriously when we started scoring it. I don't know why, but uh, I think when you um, up the ante of it and there's more competition, people take things more seriously. So I don't know if people are excited. Would you like to know what the judges were thinking? We had three judges, by the way. Would the Igniters be interested in knowing? Yeah. Yes. 
that's the whole point. Okay, so yes. do we have? Oh, okay, it's like, there we go. Sarosh, using a calculator for that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure <laughs> 3 plus 2 really. 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus <laughs> 0, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> so while he's adding it up. Um, Sarosh, as my mistake, he cut out. Yes. Calculators. Extra time to talk about. Okay, by the way, uh, everyone. <laughs> while he's adding it up, we <clears throat> we wanted to know by a show of hands. Uh, let's have a popular vote. Okay. It never works. It did work before. It did work in the US. It worked you know, in the hackathon. It worked in the hackathon actually. Okay. Anyways, uh, people. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, let's see. Uh, I do. I remember everyone's names. Yes, I think I do. No <laughs> book. Yeah, I mean, I work for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, let's just start off uh, in, in the order that's in the book. So, how many people go for Mir Ibrahim Sajid, the innovationist? The watch guy. The watch guy. Okay, that's, oh, that's the whole crowd. <laughs> Everyone. Okay. How many people um, for Dr. Hobatik? All right. Okay. This is a popular vote. Okay, so people don't don't mind. Okay, there's not nothing personal. Okay, about uh, Mahin Khan and Mehek Narmin. All right. Okay. Okay. Dr. Shalina Bhamani and Mona Jindani. Last speakers. All right. All right. And Ome Eman Chipa. Okay. And uh, people are like repeating, the like, you know, yeah. hand again, <laughs> each other's friends. Okay, and uh, last but not least, Dr. Walid Faruqi. All right, okay, so uh, everyone's a winner over here, I mean. Okay. So, uh, yes, okay, let's, let's, are we done, Sarosh? Okay. Checking, rechecking. checking Okay, by the way, everyone is invited. Uh, no, like not for the dinner. Sorry, that's my invitation only. I'm like, sorry. I cannot invite everyone to dinner, but everyone's invited to whatever follows dinner, which is a concert and uh, local talent, I was told. Tunes and trauma, okay? The tunes may or may not give you trauma. Uh, there we go, Khalid. <laughs> but uh, would highly encourage people to come out for that. And uh, there's going to be chai and snacks and beverages, so do come out, and um, and we'll have a great um, um, setup over there. So I don't have what else to. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of things to say. Oh yes, there's a DJ. There's DJ Oscar. Before we end, I would especially like to thank Mr. Kareem uh, for his excellent work uh, in this. Without that, uh, having it night would not have been possible. So Kareem, very much, very thankful. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, that wasn't like. Uh, yeah, that's a good, 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 good idea. Okay, so uh, who's going to come out and uh, announce? Um, how about uh, Nathan? Would you like to? All right. So you're going to ask Nathan. He was one of the judges, by the way. <laughs> you're gonna, you'll be targeted later. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to. Okay, we're not going to say for a second, third. These are the top three. So just announce. <coughs> these are the top three. So these are the top three. Oh. All right. We, we, we are announcing the top three people. Okay. It does not mean it's first, second, and third. All right. I can't read your writing. So <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I point out the names. I point out the names. Okay. okay. So the top three. Yeah, top three. It's not in any uh, order. Okay. Ibrahim Sajid. <laughs> Made a brain target. Target. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And that's when. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How about I just say <laughs> lost? <laughs> okay, so that's Ume Eman Chipa. <laughs> I just thought I couldn't read your writing. <laughs> it 
and Dr. Shalina Bamani and Mona Gidandi. Yes, we will. <laughs> they were all very good. I think that's, I really enjoyed that. That's something we should probably try to integrate in, in the U.S. Medical School. I like the, uh, the eagerness. Uh, the passion for what you're doing, so keep it up. Great, Great thank you. Um, we're going to announce the rest of them as well. We've got certificates for the rest of the people, so we'll just go ahead and uh, give them out. So, uh, Leila, may we have you here? So, Leila is going to give out the remaining certificates and I'll read out the names. Okay, so okay, I don't need this anymore. Yeah. Okay. Mova Atik. Maheen Khan. Oh, okay. Well, one at a time, I guess. Yeah, Do you? <laughs> yeah one at a time. <laughs> Mehek Narmeen. Dr. Valid Farooqi. Valid, what's that? Give me a photo of me. We can't see that again. We don't want to see it. I'd also like to point out that Valid actually shaved and had his glasses changed for this event only. <laughs> 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 